So recently, I've been thinking about all the hurts and heartaches of God's people, all the quandaries and the questions we face in the, in the hard times, and especially all the long and lonely nights that we pass through until finally the promise is fulfilled. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That's Psalm 30, verse 5. When the Lord Jesus made his way to Calvary, we read first about the high priest's garment being rent. It was specifically designed and like a coat of mail. It was woven from the top throughout so that it would make it virtually impossible to tear it, certainly by accident. And uh, But the high priest was so offended at the claims of Jesus that he tore his garment and effectively, he ended the Jewish priesthood with all its endless sacrifices that could never take away sin. That was really the death knell of human religion, man's efforts at being reconciled to God, establishing their own righteousness, Paul calls it. And then we read about the rocks being rent. It seems that the trauma was so horrific that the sun hid its face and the rocks broke apart at the agony of their creator being murdered. It's as if to say if, if humanity's brazenness and pride surpasses the glaring brightness of the sun and the flinty hardness of the rocks, then at least inanimate creation will show its brokenness and shame at that awful scene. But it's not only the rending of the high priest's garments and the rending of the rocks, but as we know, the real focus on the story is the rending of the veil. That's what shocks us the most. It's this tapestry, which they say was thicker than a man's hand. It wasn't some thin veil as we think of it, but it was this, this woven tapestry that Josephus says two yoke of oxen could not tear it apart. And it hung there between sinful people and a holy God for 1,500 years, first in the tabernacle, later in the temple. As you remember, it was woven with cherubim, and they were there to remind the people that our first parents had been thrown out of the Garden of Eden, and they couldn't go back in because of these angels with flaming swords that stood barring the way. But at the very moment when Jesus cried, it is finished, uh, this massive barrier 60 feet high, suddenly from the top, it began to tear in two. It would seem to me that the Holy Spirit, who had been resting on the Lord Jesus all through his ministry, now had withdrawn into the sanctuary because now sin was going to be placed on the Lord Jesus, and he was left alone there. But it seems the Holy Spirit has been waiting until that moment when with joy, he tears the veil in two. And so what seemed to be the ruination of the veil was a, a declaration of something absolutely wonderful. The true veil between God and humanity, we learn, was the body of Christ through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And when the true body of Christ had been torn on the cross, what seems to be the worst thing that ever happened turned into the best thing that ever happened. It was actually the opening up of a doorway right up into the heart of God. And so we read this, right? Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 22. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. 
let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And so this seems to be the grand theme here, that when we have times in our lives when we feel torn to shreds, it's actually opening up a doorway into the presence of God. We can only know the God of all comfort. We can only know the comfort of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God, the nearness of God. When we go through these horrific times, this rending opens the way into the presence of God. And this little story is an illustration of this principle. It, what seems to be ruined is in actual fact a new opening, a new beginning of a relationship with God. We come to know God in an intimate way in those times like we never could any other way. The story is an attempt to look at this question, what can God do with something that is so badly ruined we can't imagine any way to repair it? Because that's where some of us are. Something precious has been torn from our hearts, and we can't imagine how it ever could be fixed. You know, at the time that Jesus cried, it's finished, something else was rent. The graves of the believers were rent. They were torn open. And these people came to life and came back, came into the city of Jerusalem. And, you know, this idea that it wasn't just the end of man's efforts at religion. It wasn't just the end of this barrier between a holy God and sinful people. It was also the end of the domination of death. Death had become a doorway into the presence of God through Jesus. He did that. And so what seems to be the rending of a loved one who has died, especially when they die in sudden and unexpected ways, and we feel torn apart, is actually a reunion of the soul with the Lord. It's this stitching together of a believer in the life of God, and they'll never be parted again. That's what this little story is about. So my father was born and raised in Scotland. And when he was a little boy, he was an, an only child. His little sister had died as a, an infant. And um, they had moved out to a little farm in a place called Kinnis Head outside of Glasgow. And it was a lovely little spot. There was a creek there. My dad used to go down and fish in the creek. And he, he really, it was an idyllic life for him. But one of the disadvantages was that they were out of circuit. They, they rarely got visitors. And of course, in those days, very few people had automobiles. Most people used uh, the bus, the public transport. And so they didn't get many visits. Now, in those days, uh, most houses would have a parlor, not like our family room or living room. A parlor was closed off, and it was only used when visitors came. And so it was always neat and tidy. The children didn't get to play in there, and it was opened up for special guests. And so the problem was that the best window to look down the laneway to see people coming happened to be in the parlor. And on this particular day, my dad heard a car coming down the lane. And so he opened the doors of the parlor, which was dark, and he ran in and he jumped up on a chair so he could look down the lane. What he didn't know was that my grandfather, who was quite an artist in his own right, had painted an oil painting a seascape of the open sea. And it was sitting on that chair, drying. And my father put his foot right through the canvas. 
Well, my grandfather didn't throw it away. He took the canvas and very carefully he stitched together the rent in such a way that it became the rigging of an old ship. And he painted in the ship, plowing its way through the waves and made it a far more interesting painting than it could have been any other way. Dear Christian, do you feel like that? Standing there looking at the ruination and saying, what, what could ever come of this? And God is standing by. And he points us to the cross and he say, you see this? The worst thing that ever happened in the history of the world. You see what I did with it? And death. Death was the result of the curse, the result of sin. You know what I did with it? I took it back. I claimed it back. And Paul says, death is yours. Do you know every blessing you have ever or will ever receive comes to you through death? Either the death of Christ for us at Calvary or our own spiritual death when we put to death self and enter into the life of of blessing with God, or our physical death, when we actually pass out of this world through this new rent way, this, this ripped open way into the presence of God. My heart goes out to you today, and I just plead with you to remember that weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning.